Hi, Fresh Ed listeners, it's Will. Before we start the show today, I want to let you know that we are holding our annual general meeting on April 23rd. It's a public event where you can learn more about the Fresh Ed organization and help us shape its future. So if you'd like to join, please visit freshedpodcast.com slash AGM. Again, that's freshedpodcast.com slash AGM. The meeting will take place on Zoom, so I hope you can join. Hope to see you tomorrow. Okay, now on with today's show. This is Fresh Ed, a weekly podcast that makes complex ideas in educational research easily understood. I'm your host, Will Brem. Today, we look at the history and changes of Ukrainian scholarly discourse. My guest is Liz Shepetelnikova. So for instance, we see this through this gradual transition from the de- discourse of decommunization towards the discourse of decolonization and this attempt to not just write academic papers, but to actively engage with communities and to actively engage across the disciplines in order to formulate what does decolonization mean in the Ukrainian context. Liz Shepetelnikova is a PhD candidate at the University of Hong Kong, researching transformations of the Ukrainian higher education and academic profession. She has recently published the article, Mending the Divide, Intellectuals and Intelligentsia in Ukrainian Scholarly Discourse. Liz Shepetelnikova, welcome to Fresh Ed. Thank you for having me. So there's been a lot of talk sort of of late about Russians' imperial ambitions in Ukraine, which is where you are from. And of course, this isn't the first sort of imperial conquest that Ukraine has experienced. Can you sort of give listeners by way of background, what are some of the, you know, instances in history of foreign powers trying to control or conquer Ukraine? Yeah, Ukraine is indeed located in this part of Eastern Europe, which has been a target of multiple colonial ambitions over the centuries. There are many reasons for it, oftentimes natural resources, including oil and gas, but most frequently black earth, which is widely discussed also in historic scholarship in terms of its fertility and the value it has for the region more broadly. Interestingly enough, even nowadays in Ukraine, you can hear stories of people who experienced living in up to five different states without ever leaving their village. So Russia today is most widely discussed colonial power on this territory. However, of course, there were many others. What were the others? So before the World War I, a part of Ukraine has been incorporated into the Habsburg Empire, Nowadays, you can hear from locals that it was one of the most civilized empires that ruled over Ukrainian territory, which is not something that comes in mind of many scholars. And after, in 1917, Ukrainian part that was a part of Russia has actually tried to separate proclaiming an independent Ukrainian People's Republic. Similar has happened in Western Ukraine, where in 1918, Western Ukrainian People's Republic was formed. And a year later, in 1919, they've signed the Union Treaty, which has basically brought what is now widely known as Ukrainian territory together. However, because this territory has been under control of so many imperial powers without its own statehood, there was very little information available to Western powers in particular about the region. And globally, native Ukrainian population or Ruthenians, as they were called at the time, have largely not been heard. They've been mostly enslaved by the colonial powers through serfdom. And therefore, after the World War I, the negotiations of the winning powers have resulted in Ukraine, although proclaimed as an independent state, being once again partitioned at that point between the Soviet Union and the Polish Republic. So you can see how this story has continued throughout the 20th century, when you look at the history of the World War II, when Stalin and Hitler, through their pact, first partitioned Poland, and in that way, Stalin takes over part of Western Ukraine. Then, of course, Nazi would 
go against Stalin and reoccupy this territory, making it the territory of double occupation, as Timothy Snyder puts it, right? So after the Second World War, Stalin and the Soviet Union would take back the territories of Western Ukraine and join them with the other territories that at the time have formed the Ukrainian Soviet Republic. And it's not until 1991 that Ukraine would become an independent state in itself. This is, of course, you know, a very high <laughs> overview. Of course, yeah. I think, you know, that insight you had about there's people in certain villages in Ukraine that are sort of nostalgic for a particular empire, the Habsburg Empire. And it's sort of absurd, but it goes to the heart of, I think, what you're sort of saying is that there's been so many different occupying powers in that part of the world. And of course, some have been worse than others. And so you sort of, you can get nostalgic for a particular form of empire. It's ironic, but it's also quite telling. Absolutely. And, you know, there for those of the listeners who want to know, learn more about it, there is an excellent book by Sergei Plohi, The Gates of Europe, which talks about many of these aspects and details. So I want to zoom in on sort of the most recent form of occupation that's going on, the, the sort of the Russian aggression, the Russian war in Ukraine. And I just want to know from your experiences, both as a scholar, but someone who is from Ukraine, what is that sort of particular form of imperialism? What does it look like today? This is an excellent question and also very challenging to answer because there's very little that is known about Russian imperialism, particularly in the higher education community. You know, Russians have denied their imperial and colonial legacy. They, of course, also engaged with much of disinformation about Russia's history and their relationships with people living in diverse parts of the territories that they've colonized. And we have to also, I think, be critical of ourselves as an academic community because oftentimes, you know, scholars have oriented themselves towards Moscow or St. Petersburg as imperial centers where knowledge has been largely generated. And that also contributed to marginalization of the perspective of colonized people, both, you know, colonized by the Russian Empire and later by the Soviet Union. I think from my personal experience and from my research, it is important to understand that Russian imperialism has some common characteristics across the various regions and peoples that Russians occupied, but it also varies. So what I'm going to be talking about in terms of Ukraine has some analogies somewhere else, but not necessarily is the same. Because Ukraine geographically lies on this frontier of European civilization. And that geographic location and several historical events that were happening there has made it critical for Russian historical claims to take over this particular territory and control it. For example, you know, the very name Russia comes from the ancient state Rus, which was based of Kyiv. So it is very hard for a state to claim their name if they don't have control over a particular territory where that name comes from. Similarly, Kyiv was the religious center, and that's where Christianity has spread out from to other territories of Eastern Europe. This is a reference that, of course, we can hear very often on the news these days from some Russian politicians. What is another important factor is that Ukraine's proximity to other European countries made it much more easier for people on this territory and intellectuals in particular to engage with various ideas. For instance, first universities in the region appeared particularly in Ukraine, right? So the oldest institution in Ukraine, Ostrah Academy, dates back to 1576. And then Kiev Mohyla Academy, which educated so many Russian imperial intellectuals and elites, was founded in 1632. So you can see how that geographic location, that intellectual proximity made Ukrainian territory really critical to the 
Russian imperial project. That's where they draw their legitimacy from. And that makes the process of colonization very, you know, context specific. So for instance, one of the key aspects of Russian colonization of Ukraine is uniformity. So in order to make sure that Russia has legitimate claims and its political dogma is not challenged, for Russians, it was practically critical to basically make sure that Ukraine as a separate national idea did not exist. And as some historians would argue, you know, the key challenge to the Russian empire was really the very idea of nation, because it has challenged the way the relationship has been built between Russians in imperial center and those on the outskirts of empire. So from that perspective, what Russian de- Russians did in order to in- implement this uniformity was a whole area of different tools. One of them is very well known and understood in other contexts, particularly in North American, it's settled colonialism, right? So particularly during establishment of cities in Ukrainian territory and industrialization, most of the people who would move to the cities would not be Ukrainian. The reason for that is actually very pragmatic because this was happening in, in the 19th century before the abolition of serfdom. And under serfdom, Ukrainian peasants had not had opportunity to choose where they would live because they belonged to a particular landlord. Therefore, what happens is Russian serfs who actually had an opportunity to move as long as they paid a tax to their landlord would move to newly established Ukrainian cities to take on jobs and, you know, factories and various enterprises that were established. Another aspect of this, of course, is the control over the movement of the territory, right? So the Russian colonialism has often focused on making sure that specific categories of Ukrainian populations are in the places and working on the tasks that are particularly valuable to the imperial economic development. And we can see this most vividly during the early years of the Soviet rule, which has led to one of the biggest tragedy of Ukrainian population in the 20th century. Particularly during the collectivization of farms, Ukrainian peasants have been not supportive of this process. There were numerous peasants uprising, Also, by the way, because in some territories, people already had the right to private property. So collectivization for them essentially meant that their private property is being taken away. And because of that resistance that Ukrainian population has demonstrated, we have had the biggest famine in our history. Nowadays, we call it Holodomor that happened in 19. Uh, 32, 1933, and killed over 4 millions of Ukrainians. It's one of those, you know, cases where this is an event that has been absolutely intentionally made by the Soviet authorities as a payback to the Ukrainian peasants, yet it has been denied and censored for decades. But of course, you know, Ukraine is a very vast territory and uh, its population is not just ethnic Ukrainians and it's not just peasants. So we can see those diverse manifestations in Russian colonialism in experiences of other ethnic groups in the territory of Ukraine, particularly those issues of limited uh, settlement opportunities could be seen in experiences of Jews in Ukraine, because Jews has been limit have been limited to the pale of settlement since Russian imperial times. And it also limited the kind of professions that they could undertake. So limiting their professional opportunities on the territory as well. In the southern Ukraine, settled colonialism has been merged with religious assimilation, for instance, because southern Ukraine has been traditionally occupied by Crimean Tatars, which is a Muslim population native to this region, particularly native to Crimea. And um, What has been seen during the Soviet period in that territory is, of course, massive unveiling of Crimean Tatars. And this is an experience which a lot of 
people in Central Asia also had to go through, unfortunately. So there are many different manifestations which are both unique, but also can be seen elsewhere. However, unfortunately, there is little scholarship, you know, especially critical scholarship produced about this historical experiences through isolation of those colonized uh, people and their intellectuals, oftentimes their perspectives have been silenced. And at the same time, unfortunately, over decades, we've seen that there was very little critical reflections coming out about it from Russian intellectuals. So I hope that, you know, with Ukrainian perspective slowly emerging and integrating into the global academic discourse, we can provide a kind of decolonial view on the Russian empire. So and this is sort of where we're going to get to today. I mean, I guess, you know, it's quite interesting to see the connections of higher education and the intellectuals in higher education and their connections to the Soviet Union, to Russia, because they're so geographically close. How would you describe the connection between between sort of, you know, intellectuals and higher education system in Ukraine with, you know, the quote unquote West, if, if we were to go in the other direction, look, look towards Europe and into North America, you know, what's the connection? How would you describe that connection between Ukraine and the West? So what we know so far is really that Ukrainian intellectual tradition developed in very close relationship with the European and Ukrainian thinkers and scholars consistently engaged with their European counterparts throughout centuries. Medieval universities that I've mentioned before, such as Ostroga Academy and Kiev Mogila Academy, largely drew on Greek philosophical traditions and European theological traditions in their education. In the 19th century, we see a growing influence of German philosophy and philosophical ideas on both, uh, you know, intellectual community and universities themselves. In some instances, for example, in case of Kharkiv University, a German scholar, Johann Baptist Schad, was the one who came to chair the first philosophy department. So there is this very close interplay in Kyiv University at the time. In order to get a position, a scholar was first sent for several years research to Europe. For example, this is what happened with a famous Ukrainian political thinker and a first sociologist, as he called himself, Mikhailo Drahomanov. He completed his studies at the university, and then the university has commissioned for him to go to Europe before he could take over, take the lecturer's position. This interchange of ideas has been constantly going on until the Soviet occupation, basically. With the integration of Ukrainian territory into the Soviet Union in uh, 1922, what we see is this increased isolation of the intellectual community. However, that doesn't mean, in case of Ukraine, that there was no engagement with the West, so as we call it, and Western ideas, because by this time, there is a growing Ukrainian intellectual diaspora in the West. So uh, we see that, for instance, during the interwar period, when Soviets are trying to take over Ukrainian territory, some of the researchers move from Ukraine to other European countries. A famous Ukrainian historian, Mikhailo Hrushevsky at the time, establishes a first Ukrainian sociological institute, for example, abroad. During the World War II, a lot of Ukrainian researchers are being displaced to European countries, and many of them lived in the DP camps for years, and there they've created what is now known as the Artistic Ukrainian Movement. Inside of the DP camps, they basically created their own educational institutions to train young children and uh, teenagers, you know, and engage with themselves with those ideas. Many of them would eventually stay in Europe and some would move to North America. So in the 20th century, you know, we've seen establishment of some of the critical Ukrainian research institutions, for example, in Canada, the Ukrainian Research Institute and the University of Alberta, and then, of course, the Harvard Ukrainian 
Indian Research Institute. So diaspora essentially has continued to play this critical role of deconstructing Soviet narratives about Ukraine at the time when Ukrainian intellectuals in the Soviet Union were largely isolated from the global academic discourse. And this would later, you know, in 1991, once Ukraine becomes independent, contribute to development of the newly independent intellectual landscape in Ukraine, right, that has very much kind of relied on this diasporic knowledge. You know, it's really quite fascinating to see the sort of shifts over time when it comes to intellectual histories and how ideas move and how people move and then how different sort of political projects get created. And then, like you said, start looking inward and, and put up barriers. But these ideas and these people who have migrated out previously have it, were able to sort of build up their own scholarship and, or, you know, collectively as well. And in the article that you've written, you make a big distinction between sort of intellectuals and intelligentsia to try and help us make sense of some of these dynamics can you know can you give the listener a little bit of you know an overview of why is it important to distinguish between intellectuals and intelligentsia and and why are you using that those terms to help make sense of this phenomenon absolutely intelligentsia is a very peculiar term which is mostly used in eastern europe really it emerges as Malia said, as a class of this thinking men in barbarous society, because at the time, you know, in 19th century, what we're observing in this territory is that Russian empire is modernizing much slower compared to other European empires. And that essentially means that access to even basic education is very limited. So intelligentsia emerges as this group of people who are first and foremost uh, focusing on enlightenment, on engaging with the masses and sharing knowledge. However, what we see later on is that there is a growing disparity and the growing disconnect between what is happening in Eastern Europe, particularly the parts that are integrated into the Russian Empire, compared to other territories in Europe. And that leads to a growing antagonism between Russia and the rest of the Europe. And in a sense, it creates a foundation for this dichotomy that I've discussed in my paper, because Russians are beginning to juxtapose themselves with Western Europeans. And this develops fully during the Soviet period, because once the Soviet Union is being formed and the communists take over power, they're using this idea of intelligentsia to justify basically their claim to power. The reason for that is very simple and very straightforward. Neither of the Bolshevik leadership have actually been working class people. They've all had access to some sort of higher education. Some of them, you know, dropped out, others were kicked out, but nevertheless, they were no working men. So they needed a concept that would justify why they they're leading this communist revolution. And they use the idea of intelligentsia specifically for those purposes. They've expanded it to include all kinds of people. And then they weaponized it by arguing that essentially intelligentsia is moral group that is concerned with moral aspects of life, whereas intellectuals have been you know, used as a synonym to Western capitalists. And by creating the dichotomy, they basically made sure that this idea that has developed at the time in the West, that intellectual is someone who could question the power, who could criticize the power, that idea would not take roots in the Soviet Union because intellectuals were portrayed as this very negative phenomenon to begin with. And intelligentsia was kept in bay with this idea that the role of intelligentsia is to be moral authority rather than engage in questioning the actual authority of the Communist Party. Interesting. So now let's fast forward to the sort of end of the Soviet Union. What happens to intellectuals and the intelligentsia and just sort of, you know, Ukrainian higher education discourse? What happens 
in this moment of radical transformation away from the Soviet Union? So I think what's important to highlight here is that there is no radical transformation. What we're seeing is the very gradual change because Soviets systematically eliminated Ukrainian intellectuals. There were professors who were fired and deported and killed since 1922 onwards. Whole generations executed in 1930s and then in 1960s. You know, in Ukraine in particular, until 1985, there were political prisoners prisoners who died in Gulag. So the whole idea of kind of perestroika or opening up to the West has really been an idea that maybe has resonated with the experiences of people somewhere in Russia, but not really in Ukraine. And for that reason, when every generation had to kind of reinvent the ideas from the scratch, 1990s presented this unique opportunity where several generations of intellectuals could actually engage with one another. For the first time, what they were able to do is really to ask a question, what is Ukrainian intelligentsia? Not the Soviet intelligentsia in the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, but the Ukrainian one. And coming together around that question has been probably the most important aspect of it in the 90s. And this opening up and liberalization kind of took on that also allowed them to engage in discussing the, this question with their co colleagues in the diaspora because they started coming back to Ukraine and helping establish new academic institutions. The real push forward really happened after the 2004 Orange Revolution, with, when political liberalization really allowed to open up a lot of archives and get access to much of the information and knowledge that was censored during the Soviet period. And that kind of marked this period of really rethinking and relearning what was and what is the role of Ukrainian intellectuals and intelligentsia. How would you describe the role of intellectuals in Ukraine before the recent war with Russia, like before Russia invaded? How would you describe the shape of that, the intellectual community in Ukraine? Before 2014 and Russian invasion, Ukrainian intellectual community has been often struggling with dealing with its Soviet legacy. And this is something that we talk in detail about with uh, Professor Anatoly Alexienko in our most recent paper, um, What Comes After the Post-Soviet, as we try to elaborate on this concept of de-Sovietization. Because the downside of that very peaceful divorce, as Paul Denieri calls it, between Ukraine and Russia or the Soviet Union, was the fact that many of the Soviet elites stayed in power. And that includes faculty. That includes rectors of universities. That includes administrative staff in the university. So, you know, the names of the department might have been changed from scientific communism to history of political movements, but the people haven't changed. So what we saw quite a bit during those first two decades of Ukraine's independence is this significant path dependence the reluctance to acknowledge strong influence of the Soviet legacy and reluctance to engage in deconstructing that Soviet legacy. In 2014, um, the impact of the Revolution of Dign Dignity and uh, Russian invasion has pushed forward that discussion a little bit. But we have seen mostly very narrow measures. You know, the idea of decommunization is one of those examples, for instance, where uh, there is an acknowledgement that Ukraine has to depart from its communist legacy, but it doesn't necessarily look deep into the behavioral patterns, into the intellectual patterns. It was very much focused on just rebranding once again, right? So a very performative kind of Soviet style action. What was important after 2014 was the fact that there's began this movement towards disengaging from the Soviet legacy. Um, and it's a challenging process once again, but at least it allowed Ukrainian intellectual community to abandon this dichotomy of intellectuals versus intelligentsia, to 
come to realize that there is a need for a new interpretation of the role of the intellectual in this society, that being a so-called post-Soviet academic that does performative work no longer works. It no longer serves the purpose. So that would be probably the major shift. And of course, you know, it still continues and develop to develop. Has anything changed since February of 2022, you know, in the last, say, two years during, you know, when when Russia invaded Ukraine again, has the intellectual community changed again or has it pushed forward this process even more to, you know, a greater extent? Like what happened since the war started two years ago? So I think we have to acknowledge that this is a very challenging question because First and foremost, I know from my dissertation research that a lot of scholars are very reluctant to reflect on their experiences because they think it's just a little bit too fresh at this point. And of course, you know, our concern with objectivity requires that we take a little bit more time and space. However, I think that there are at least several things that we could already identify that have changed. First and foremost, I think what changed is really the way that purpose of intellectuals is seen now within the academic community. So from my dissertation research, I know that a lot of intellectuals do acknowledge at this point that there is no place for a university as an ivory tower in Ukrainian context. So for a scholar, it is necessary to serve a broader society. And that manifests in a variety of different ways. First and foremost, of course, in formulating new ideas and senses. Second, in criticizing the government and those in power. And third, of course, in terms of engaging with the public. So, for instance, we see this through this gradual transition from the de discourse of decommunization towards the discourse of decolonization and this attempt to not just write academic papers, but to actively engage with communities and to actively engage across the disciplines in order to formulate what does decolonization mean in the Ukrainian context, right? And there's much more nuances emerging right now because it's a very intentional process of trying to burst boundaries and engage with diverse groups. And one of the scholars that I've interviewed for, for my thesis, I think has articulated it very well. Uh, the decolonization project in Ukraine is very much a project about understanding what is Ukrainianness. You know, Liz, it's it's so fascinating to think how this sort of intellectual history that you're looking at in Ukraine, you know, it says something about decolonizing. But of course, in Ukraine, it's so colonization is so multi-layered and multifaceted and over centuries, right? I mean, we're talking a very long time that you're trying to like sort of decolonize. So, you know, I, I guess the question is something about what does the Ukrainian experience offer the larger sort of global discourse on decolonizing knowledge, which is quite commonplace today? Yeah, it's an excellent question. I think there are at least two points that I can clearly see right now. First and foremost, Ukrainian experience really shows that decolonizing is a non-linear process and the naive perspective, uh, you know, of many academics in early 90s that post-Soviet states somehow are just going to become normal Western state really was naive. The process of transformation is much more complicated. And the second part that I think is critical goes back to what Spivak wrote in back in 2006 about how often, unfortunately or arguably falsely, in academia, it is perceived that colonialism has only one model because we're so often we focus on the single nation as a colonizer and a single nation as a colonized, right? The case of Ukraine really highlights how different colonial powers on the same territory could create this space 
which is very challenging and very complicated and very complex. And how one of those powers could be a power that claimed for decades to be anti-colonial, particularly in case of Ukraine, the Soviet Union. So I think that, you know, the, we are offering perspective, which could really uh, provide us an opportunity to broaden understanding of colonized and colonizer. And what does it really mean to engage in decolonization? not only in academic community, but also in a broader society. Well, Liz Shepetelnikova, thank you so much for joining Fresh Ed. Really a pleasure to talk and fingers crossed on your dissertation defense coming up. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure being with you. Liz Shepetelnikova is a PhD candidate at the University of Hong Kong. Her new article is Mending the Divide, which can be found in the journal European Societies. Please note that opinions expressed on Fresh Ed are solely those of the host or the guest interviewed, not Fresh Ed, which takes no institutional position. If you've liked what you've heard today, please rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Reviews really do help. Fresh Ed's team includes Fatih Aktas, Obafemi Ungunle, Phyllis Che Mensa, Jose Neto, and Sabrina Matiri. Original music for Fresh Ed was created by Digital Primate. Fresh Ed is an independently run podcast without advertisements and is made possible by the support of NORAG, the Shock Debt Family Fund, and listeners like you. Please consider donating to Fresh Ed by visiting freshedpodcast.com slash donate. Thanks for listening. I'm Will Brem, and I'll be back next week.